I V M. Welcome to All Things Policy, a daily podcast supported by Pragati, a flagship media initiative of the Takshashila Institution. We're a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru, and we like to bring a fresh perspective to Indian affairs and an Indian perspective to global affairs. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and join us for today's chat. Hi, and welcome to another episode of All Things Policy. I am Ananya Desai, Assistant Program Manager at the Takshila Institution, and I am here today with Rohan Pai. Hello, everyone. I am Rohan Pai. I am also an Assistant Program Manager at the Takshila Institution. Today, we will be discussing the role of Nama Metro in solving Bengaluru's traffic congestion problem. So let me start with a bit of context because I know our listeners are from all over India, not just Bangalore. So Nama Metro translates to our metro in Canada, and it currently holds the place of India's second largest operational metro network. It spans seventy-three kilometers, and it follows the Delhi Metro, which spans about three ninety-two kilometers overall. Phase one of the project is complete, and there are currently two lines open to the public: the purple and the green. But there are also four more lines in development. The first stretch between Bypanahalli and MG Road. was opened on 20th of October 2011 and this spanned a mere 6.7 kilometers but 12 years later the entire 43.49 kilometer stretch of the purple line from Chalagatta in the west to Whitefield in the east so the average daily passenger ridership of the purple line when it started was just around 25000 but it is now up to more than 6 lakhs and another point that i think is very important to acknowledge about nama metro specifically is that when it opened its first underground section from kabin park to the Bangalore City Railway Station in April 2016 it marked South India's first ever underground metro station and this is especially an impressive feat because in the Deccan plateau where which Bangalore is located on it contains section of hard rock beneath the soil and this has posed a major obstacle for tunnel boring machines during the construction of the routes and due to the hard rock these tunnel boring machines could not run continuously so work had to be halted for a day or two just to make sure that the cutter doesn't actually wear out and this caused major delays in the metro construction also attempt set uh, cutting out these delays and speeding up the process was also risky because it could drive up the power usage in the area and affect the water or power supply of people living in areas nearby so these were the reasons for the delays of phase 1 of the metro station of the nama metro phase 2 might possibly suffer the same delays as there was a geological investigation conducted recently by the bangalore metro rail corporation limited or bmrcl and this revealed that 34% of the underground stretch is hard and weathered rock while only 46% is soft soil and the remaining 20% consists of mixed geology conditions so i want to uh, ask the question are these delays merely a matter of annoyance or do they actually have some tangible consequences ananya what do you think so the urgent need for metro connectivity of course stems from the infamous bengaluru traffic situation In February this year the TomTom traffic index estimated Bengaluru second most traffic congested city after London. MN Srihari who is a well known transportation advisor submitted a report with his team in August this year. They highlighted some recommendations to ease traffic conditions like preventing parallel parking on roads, synchronizing traffic signals and constructing say multi-level car parking facilities. They identified the city's predominant traffic hotspots to be junctions like Silk Road, Ibbalur, Kadu Bisana Halli, Dairy Circle, Tin Factory, Hebal, Goragunte Palya, Sarakki, Ban Shankri, and Kumara Swami layout. The more traffic congestion in an area, higher is the need for metro connectivity, right? Now, why are these areas such traffic hotspots in the first place? We have seen an increase in population and vehicle density owing to the considerable growth of the IT sector. Bengaluru used to be 88 square kilometers wide, but now it has expanded to 985 square kilometers in 2023, with a proposed further expansion to 1100 square kilometers. However, the road infrastructure in the city has not progressed with this growth and has caused delays, congestions and economic losses also. How would you say that the traffic is actually linked to the economic losses? See, MN Srihari's report suggests that delays, congestions and higher travel times translate into tangible economic losses because they affect productivity, fuel consumption and overall economic output. Based on the report, 
Bengaluru loses a whooping 19,725 crore Indian rupees per year because of traffic. There was another study by the Institute for Social and Economic Change, ISIC, which estimated that Bangaloreans may be losing close to 7 lakh hours of productivity a year because of traffic itself. This is because they found that commuters using public transport are earlier to work compared to private transport users. They suggested that policymakers should focus their efforts towards a reliable and efficient public transport system. Okay, so the Nama Metro can help ease traffic congestion? Yes, Uh, this is where the Metro comes in because of course it takes a large number of commuters off the roads. The duration of a Metro journey from station A to station B is more or less fixed. Any delay in extending metro connectivity furthers the direct or indirect issues posed by traffic congestion. Traffic bottlenecks are absolutely dynamic and they can change based on infrastructure redevelopment as we saw with the Namma Metro's purple line. See, the extension to Chalaghatta and the stretch between Bayapanahalli and Kearpura were delayed for quite a while. And metro commuters were very vocal online about this and about the extreme traffic conditions in the area. The need to open the entire purple line was only emphasized by the unusual traffic snarl that we saw on the outer ring road on September 27 this year. The situation made several headlines as we know, as the traffic police's congestion estimate for a usual Wednesday was 197, but on this particular day, it was a staggering 1069. Once the line commenced full operation, There was considerable decrease in traffic during rush hours, especially on Old Madras Road outside Bayapanahalli Station and between Tin Factory and Whitefield. The average length of queued vehicles went from 2.1 kilometers in late September to 1 kilometer after the line fully opened. Some would argue that the unusual September 27 traffic was the breaking point that finally led to the entire purple line opening up. But Rohan, what do you think? Was the decision to open it up a matter of connectivity or something else? I think it becomes important to question the motives of the Nama Metro project because improved connectivity, of course, comes to mind immediately. However, with the opening of the entire Purple Line stretch that took place on 9th October, I feel the delays were arguably avoidable. For example, the 2.1 km Kiarpura by Panhali section of the Purple Line was an important junction, junction between two stretches of the Purple Line And it had been approved by the Commissioner of Metro Rail Safety weeks before they were opened to the public. The inauguration, however, was delayed in order to wait for the Kengeri Chalagata stretch to also be inspected so that the entire purple line could be formally opened at the same time in one go. Now, this decision faced major backlash from the public, understandably. And there were several politicians who accused the state government of prioritizing PR over connectivity. I think the backlash did pay off in the end because the BMRCL was instructed to open services on the new stretches of the Purple Line on an immediate basis without delaying operations to hold any formal inauguration ceremony with the VIP presence. But now that it's open, I think we should discuss whether the line has actually been running smoothly. Have there been any new challenges? When we talk about metro connectivity, it also implies increasing the number of metro carriages themselves. Again, we saw this play out with the Purple Line recently. Metro ridership substantially increased when the full line opened, which requires an increased frequency in trains too. The BMRCL managing director told TOI that they want to have more trains running at frequent intervals, but they're currently not in a position to do so. Though they extended the line, there are insufficient rakes or coaches to accommodate this increase in ridership. Out of BMRCL's 57 train sets, 30 are on the purple line and 22 are on the green line. What do you think are some of the possible solutions to this issue of overcrowding? So the most obvious solution for overcrowding is obviously adding more metro cars to the purple line. And in 2019, the Chinese company CRRC or Chinese Railway Rolling Stock Corporation had bid to manufacture 216 coaches for the purple line or for all the lines actually for rupees 1,578 crore. However, as the company had failed to set up a manufacturing unit in India, the production got delayed. So currently, the company has formed a tie-up with a Kolkata-based company called Tita Gar Wagons, and they will take up the task of manufacturing instead. Two trains will still be imported from China, and we're actually currently waiting for that to happen, but the rest will be manufactured in India. So the reasons that have been cited for this delay 
include the CRRC facing difficulties in meeting the requirement of manufacturing 75% of the coaches in India because this was mandated by the Make in India initiative. So finding a suitable local manufacturer, which they ended up doing, was challenging. And let's not forget the COVID-19 pandemic further disrupted the manufacturing process as it disrupted most processes. Again, these delays are more than just an annoyance, I think, because they may cause people to move away from the metro as a commuting option and switch back to private transport wherever possible. And as we know, this would only aggravate the traffic congestion in the city. Stay tuned to All Things Policy. We'll be right back after a short commercial break. So I want to pose another question now. Given that we're speaking about the metro in the context of public policy, do you think there's a certain framework we can use to analyze it? Well, we can use the basic Samaj Sarkar Bazaar lens to get a better idea. When it comes to the Samaj, as MN Srihari's report already stated, higher travel time affects productivity. The metro saves time, which can possibly even reduce overall stress levels for commuters. I would argue that until we have widespread connectivity in the city with frequent trains, we won't be able to achieve Namma Metro's maximum potential in serving the Samaj. On October 27 this year, a video went viral showing intense overcrowding at Majestic Station, which is where the purple line and green lines intersect. People even compared this to the infamous crowds in Mumbai Lok. Interesting, I never imagined Bangalore would reach the crowding of Mumbai local trains. And I think if we analyze it from the Sarkar angle, the Bangalore Metro Rail Corporation Limited, or BMRCL, is a 50-50 joint venture of the government of India and the government of Karnataka. So when it comes to parties contesting for state government elections, delays in metro construction definitely could lead to a loss in votes and make parties unpopular. The Congress party, for example, in its recent manifesto for the assembly elections in May, promised to complete phase three of of the Nama Metro within one year of assuming power as well as trying to extend the metro line up to Vasant Narsapur in Tumkur. The BJP as well promised to establish a metro rail under Mission Connect Karnataka in Mysore, Hubli, Dharwad and Belgavi to ensure comfortable, affordable, safe and reliable last mile connectivity. When it comes to the bazaar, I think the two reports by MN Srihari and ISEC suffice in making the point the city is losing actual money and time. But do you think the issue of traffic congestion extends beyond Nama Metro? Definitely. I mean, the metro, of course, is one solution to traffic congestion in Bangalore, but there also exist many alternatives. In the last month alone, actually, the state government has proposed a number of solutions. One of these is a congestion tax, which is a system designed to, designed to levy, levy charges on vehicles entering specific urban zones during peak hours. And the primary motivation of such a tax is to motivate individuals to shift away from private vehicles and move towards public transportation. Under this system, where toll booths will be equipped with cameras and stationed at key entry points to high traffic areas. So when vehicles pass through these toll points, cameras would capture images and the congestion tax would be automatically deducted from the vehicle owner's bank account. Such a system is not original and has been successful in cities like Singapore, London and Stockholm because these cities actually tax vehicles entering the city on weekdays during business hours. There are several other proposed solutions as well in the last month such as uh, say parking vehicles on a certain side of the road on odd numbered days and on the other side on even numbered days. One more is adjusting the timings of schools in Bangalore to ease traffic caused by school buses and ensure the students aren't late to school as has been happening very often. And also recently, a 190-kilometer long tunnel road has actually been proposed by the government to combat traffic congestion in Bangalore. And eight companies are actually qualified for it. So it is a true possibility that uh, tunnels could be built in addition to the metro stations and the metro rail. So I think at the end of the day, what we have to understand is that metros and the metro system is definitely one solution to traffic congestion. I don't think anyone argues against that because it has eased traffic. But I don't think relying on it single-handedly is the way forward because there are several other solutions. And given that delays have been seen a number of times throughout the construction of the metro, it is likely that this trend will continue. I think in addition to accounting for the delays, we also have to account for the fact that we don't have enough metro cars 
despite extending the metro line and clearly it's causing a lot of problems so of course account for delays account for uh, lack of sufficient cars and i think if these problems were to be solved well, the namma metro would be an adequate solution for bangalore's traffic problem but considering that these problems are as they are we do need additional alternatives also yeah i agree with that thank you ananya this has been a great conversation thank you for listening to all things policy we will see you in another episode if you liked our show don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the ivm network you can tune into them on the ivm podcast app ivmpodcast.com or wherever you listen to your podcasts you can also follow ivm on social media the handle is at ivm podcasts on twitter facebook and instagram and hey if you'd like to dive into takshashila's research on technology strategy and economic affairs check us out at our twitter handle at takshashila inst or our website takshashila.org.in